The title of the message is, What is Greatness in the Eyes of God? This is part three. And the opening scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. The Apostle Paul is giving a warning to the Corinthian church, know yourself through truth. Don't be deceived about yourself lest you fall. And as I stated in the closing of the last message, through the years of the church age and beyond, even under the law, many people who counted themselves worthy of God's kingdom were not worthy in God's eyes. And others who, in humility, came into the understanding that they were unworthy of God's kingdom, it was by God's amazing grace that they were lifted up and made worthy. Through the divine blood of Jesus, sacrificed to Calvary, people become counted worthy by God to become sons and daughters of God. Many people being religious, and there is a difference between being religious and being born again. Being religious and being a servant of the Lord. Many being religious lift themselves up before God and others. The pride of their hearts blind them to themselves. They do not see themselves as God sees them, because they're blinded to the truth, counting themselves worthy of heaven when they are not. Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 through 4, And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted... And become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Plain spoken. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Greatness in the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, requires childlike humility. And I don't mean child of the present day. Most of them are rebellious, stubborn, full of the devil. Because they lack discipline, they lack God. Jesus is speaking of children 2,000 years ago. Big difference. A child's humility. In Jesus' day, it was genuine. It was from the heart. Many adults, many people will display humility outwardly. They'll display humility maybe with just certain people or in certain situations. But it's not a part of them. They don't have the spirit of humility. You can't use the spirit of humility like a coat. You put it on when you think you need it. And then you cast it aside when you think you don't need it. It's not from the heart. It's not a part of them. It's unfortunate that many stumble and fall in their walk with God because they lack the spirit of humility. Obadiah, in the New Old Testament, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3, the A part. This scripture, this saying in this verse is the foundation of today's message. Obadiah 1.3, the A part, says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. This was God speaking to his chosen people. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. In particular, deceit about self. Deceit about their spiritual condition and their relationship with God. Spiritually blind, being ignorant to themselves. They cannot see, 
therefore they fall. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. This verse speaks to when pride comes and enters your heart. Your life, sooner or later, will be in shame before God. But, if a child of God will live in a spirit of humility, they will receive wisdom from the Lord. The humble will gladly accept wisdom from the Lord when the prideful will reject it. Because the prideful do not see themselves. They're blind to themselves. They feel no need for such wisdom. But the lowly, the humble, will gladly receive wisdom from the Lord, even in the form of correction and instruction. Hebrews chapter 12, the Apostle Paul spoke to this in relationship with God and his people. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He corrects them. He disciplines them. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Take note of that. He will scourge, he will discipline every single child of his. None are spared. So if you think you're beyond the correction and chastisement of the Lord, woe is you. You've already set yourself up for a great fall. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now, again, we're speaking 2,000 years ago. Most parents today don't correct and chastise their children as they should. Hence, you have so much trouble with kids today. Not only has the Bible been taken out of schools and homes, but discipline has as well. God believes in good discipline. No matter what psychologists say, no matter what parents say, no matter what schools say or even many preachers say. Go to the Word and you'll know what God believes in. In our relationship with God, He works with us as sons and daughters. Many times, our godly wisdom and our spiritual growth is obtained, we receive it, by chastisement from the Lord and correction in His Word. But when a person's heart is filled with pride and ego, they're deceived. They won't take chastisement or correction from the Lord. They resist it for themselves because they're blind to themselves. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. But yet, people like this, usually, it's amazing how they think they can see so clearly to see the faults in others. Yet they're deceived about themselves. God declares, if you refuse his discipline, take note of this, if you refuse his discipline, he will disown you. No matter what you think of yourself and your relationship with God, he will disown you. To no longer be a part of the family of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, all in the family of God are partakers, no one is excluded. Whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons, disowned, without father. God rejects you. What makes a spirit of humility so great? A spirit of humility 
will receive correction and chastisement graciously. Without the pride and the ego blinding the heart, they see the benefit in what God is doing. Willing and thankful to be corrected in the air of their way so that they may learn and grow spiritually unto the stature of our Lord, so that they may produce spiritual fruit that is well-pleasing unto God. Hebrews 12.11, Paul continues, Now no chastening is for the present let me repeat that. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. No. You know why chastening can be grievous? Because it stings the flesh. If you look at chastisement through a spirit of humility the right way, you know that God loves you and you profit from it. Spiritually. But what why we hate chastisement? The flesh. And what works through the flesh? Pride and ego. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Fruit, pleasing and acceptable unto God. So hopefully by the word of God thus far, you see more clearly now the necessity, the greatness of the spirit of humility. And how a lack of humility has been the downfall of so many people, sinners and Christians alike. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Now I want to take you into a, a teaching Jesus gave in Luke chapter 18, where Jesus teaches an important lesson about humility and pride. Jesus says two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, a religious ruler, exalted in that society. The other was a publican, a sinner, looked down on, frowned upon in society. And Jesus said in Luke 18, 11, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Now on the, service, on the surface, this may seem reasonable, but two points I want to highlight first off with this prayer. Point number one, he prayed with himself. Now Jesus pointed this out in a very subtle way. He didn't come out and say God was not listening. He simply and subtly said he prayed with himself. He thought God was listening. God wasn't listening. The other point, this man was actually thanking God that he was better than other people. How egotistical can you be? God loves all people. Every person has a soul, and that soul came from him. God so loved the world, he gave Jesus. And for people to be so egotistical, and he was religious. By his words, this Pharisee was lifting himself up and at the same time casting other people down. Children of God, stay away from judging others. 
For only God is capable of judging. God and God alone. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned, Judge not, lest ye be judged. Children of God in this life, Jesus didn't call us to be judges. He called us to be his servants. Servants do not have the authority nor the capability of spiritually judging other people. God does. We leave it with him. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 20, 22 through 23, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. For he that is called in the Lord, child of God, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not the servants of men. Every child of God must understand through the word their responsibility before God. If they will live a life pleasing unto God, that will lead them one day to heaven. The word shows us what our responsibility is. Every child of God has been purchased, bought with a price. What did God buy you with? The sacrifice of the divine blood of his son Jesus at Calvary. That was the price he paid. So now as a child of God, you don't belong to yourself. If you went to Calvary and found forgiveness of your sins and received a born-again experience, understand you no longer belong to yourself. You are now to be a servant unto the Lord. In humility, serving the will of Christ, serving Jesus' love, mercy, faith, and patience, serving truth to those who sit in darkness, serve as a yielded vessel in the hands of the Holy Spirit. That's all we are is vessels. We have nothing profitable of ourselves to serve anyone. We're to be yielded vessels filled with the things of God. And as the Spirit moves and directs, He will use us to serve the God in us to others. Continuing on in Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 12. The Pharisee continues praying with himself. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Another fallacy with this Pharisee. Because a servant of the Lord should never boast about their service unto the Lord. Their works, their good deeds, their sacrifices made. The Bible says that being a living sacrifice is a reasonable service unto God. So there's no room to boast because it's a reasonable service. By works, pride took root in the heart of this Pharisee and deceived him. What, did, what was the result of this deceit? It gave this Pharisee a false sense of security in his relationship with God. It gave him a false sense of superiority over others. This Pharisee was not what he believed himself to be before God. Thus he prayed with himself, and no one was listening. I want to take a moment to give you some background on the religious rulers in Jesus' day. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. All were religious rulers and authorities in Israel. Experts at the law of Moses. In Israel, they were greatly respected and honored, held in high esteem among the people. In the view of that society in Jesus' day, these religious rulers were deemed great. However, in the eyes of God, 
they were not. In fact, they were the opposite of great. They were everything that Jesus and his gospel stood against. Jesus despised the Pharisees for their pride and ego, that they would lift themselves up above other people. Continually, Jesus uncovered their lifestyle of hypocrisy and their secret sins. His truth exposed these religious people before God and men, and they hated Jesus for it. It didn't matter the gospel message that Jesus preached, the mighty miracles and healings he performed, even raising the dead to life again. It didn't matter. These religious men, full of pride and ego, deceived in their hearts, sought to discredit Jesus in any way they could. Pride filled their hearts, as did self-righteousness. And they were determined to destroy Jesus and his gospel. So you see, what is greatness in the eyes of people is not greatness in the eyes of God. Matthew 5, 20, Jesus teaching about these religious rulers. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. This had to be a shock to that culture and society. Now, Jesus didn't stop there. He continued on talking about the scribes and the Pharisees and all these religious rulers. And he instructed the people, you do not sacrifice and give as they do. You do not pray as they do. You do not fast as they do. Because their hearts being deceived by pride, they do these things in the wrong spirit and for the wrong reasons. In the Pharisees' prayer in Luke chapter 18, he boasted to God about fasting. How ironic is that? He's boasting to God about his fasting. God ordained fasting to humble yourself before God. Yet he is taking the opportunity to boast about it. This Pharisee was using his fastings as a means of exalting himself before God. This Pharisee had it all wrong. And he didn't even know it. No wonder Jeremiah the prophet wrote, The heart can be deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know the heart? God knows the heart. And that's why it is important for a child of God to daily walk softly before him. That he may be able to instruct us, to correct us, and when necessary, to chastise us. And the spirit of humility will enable us to thankfully and graciously receive our Lord's discipline, to learn from it and spiritually grow stronger for it. Luke 18 Verses 13 and 14. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast an outward form of humility, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. With the spirit of humility, this sinner possessed clear spiritual vision about himself. Always keep before you and never forget that salvation and justification before God have nothing to do with you or I. Nothing. No one is worthy of God's salvation, 
No one can be justified before God by their own merit, their own efforts. Salvation is God's gift to humanity, made available by His grace through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No man can boast in God's salvation. No one can take pride or have ego when it comes to God's salvation. And once we're saved, we live by faith. And living by faith, we are justified and established in the righteousness of God. By faith, not by works. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul wrote, And be found in him, be found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. God's righteousness comes by faith. The Apostle Paul, let's look at his life for a moment. Now, his life is an extreme contrast. Before his conversion, his life was full of pride and ego. In the eyes of Israel, he was a great man, being a Pharisee. However, after his conversion... As an apostle of Christ, he lived a life of humility, despised by the general public, yet great in the eyes of God. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul describes his former life as a Pharisee, born a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, a Pharisee. And then he says this, before the law, blameless. Under the law of God, he was blameless. But then, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul then describes his life as a Pharisee, and he calls himself the chief of sinners. Think about this. In one verse in Philippians, he declares that he was blameless before the law. And then another verse in 1 Timothy, he declares himself the chief of sinners. How is it that these two verses can describe the same person? The answer, Paul's confidence was in his flesh as a Pharisee. His trust was in himself. Confidence in his zeal of the law, confidence in his own strength, confidence in his family heritage, being a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, confidence in his own talents and abilities, self-confidence. Paul was not living by faith or trust, confidence in God. Also, Paul's righteousness was self-made, it was not God-made righteousness. As he wrote in Philippians 2.9, Paul possessed his own righteousness of the law, and not God's righteousness, which is by faith in Christ. So when Paul takes his place as a Pharisee among the Jews, he possesses that same devilish pride and ego that the Pharisee that Jesus spoke of, that all the Pharisees spoke uh, that possessed, in Jesus' day. Pharisees, confidence was self. Confidence, not faith in God. Righteousness of the law, self-made, not God-made by faith. He thought himself to be better than the Gentiles, as all the Jews did. And he thought himself to be better than most of his fellow Jewish brethren. In deceit, by the pride of his heart, he set himself up to be something special before God that he was not. Paul's pride and ego 
This is what fueled his zealous hatred towards Christ and the church. And Paul, he never even seen Christ in the flesh. Yet that hate burned within him for Christ. Pride deceived Paul's heart. Believing that he was in the will of God, destroying the church and having Christians put to death. He thought he was in God's will when in reality he was an instrument in the hands of Satan. This is an extreme example of the difference between humility and pride. An extreme example. This is Paul's testimony. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse, beginning in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me. Hear that? God enabled him. For, he, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He didn't put himself there. God put him there. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was spiritually blind. He was ignorant because his pride made him ignorant. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. It was in abundance toward him, and he knew it. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. We don't have record of all that Paul did to the early church, and that's probably good that we don't. But we do know this, that for a time he devastated God's people. It is recorded in Acts that he was there to witness and give consent unto the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr in the church. Acts chapter 8 verse 3 says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, inhaling men and women committed them to prison. Havoc means widespread destruction. He committed widespread destruction against the church. Acts 22, 4, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Pride. This all starts with pride. Pride in a religious form. As a Pharisee, Paul was a blasphemer who arrested Christians, falsely accused them, injured them, killing many, and putting others into prison. And I ask you, how can such evil and hatred originate in a man who was blameless before the law? Paul's trust was not in God, it was in flesh. His righteousness was founded upon the works of the law. And along with being a relig religious ruler who was held in high esteem among the people, all of this together made a recipe for a big ego and great pride. And like Lucifer in heaven, pride and ego was Paul's downfall too. Paul's heart was deceived by pride and it all started with a lack of humility. That's why I say in a person's relationship with God, anything short of the spirit of humility and total and complete dependency upon Jesus, anything short of that, that will leave your heart's door open for pride and ego to take control and to begin to manifest through your life. Oh, it may not be as extreme as in Paul's life, but nonetheless it will be there and God will be displeased. Remember Jesus' words pertaining to our relationship with him. And this is why he said it in Matthew 16, 24, and 25. 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. The cross in that day is not the cross today. The cross in that day was a cross of shame and suffering. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Then Jesus said in John 15, verses 4 and 5, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. This is one of the greatest statements of humility in the whole Bible. And most Christians struggle to accept it and yield to it. They simply just bypass it and move on in their reading. Without me, ye can do nothing. No person can produce spiritual fruit in their life on their own, and it please God. A person must abide in Jesus and he in them, his word in them. For without Jesus and dependency upon him, your life will not please God. To embrace these truths that Jesus spoke, that are being brought before you today, and live by them, to live your daily life by them, this requires a great humility and faith in the Word of God. Child of God, as you make your journey to heaven on the narrow way, always keep before you. Never forget, you are what you are, only by the grace of God. A child of God is not self-made. A child of God is made by the divine blood of Jesus, made by the person of the Holy Ghost, and made by the Word of God that is abiding within them. That's how they're made. And they're made to please God. At Paul's conversion, his spiritual eyes were open. He had it so wrong for so long, Paul had to get away from everybody. He had to go into the desert to be alone for three and a half years to get his whole life and mind and lifestyle squared away. He would not go and talk to anybody. He was under the leadership of the Holy Ghost because he had been so far off and so wrong. And he didn't realize it. He needed the spirit of the truth for three years to set him straight. But as time went on and being taught by the Holy Ghost, Paul understood his confidence was in his flesh as a Pharisee. He was in self-righteousness. He was in pride and ego. All of this is what made him the chief of sinners who persecuted the church and destroyed Christians. And then as an apostle, Paul was greatly humbled, even to the end of life's journey. It didn't matter how God used him. It didn't matter what God did through him. He never forgot his roots. He never forgot what God brought him out of. And it is relayed in the teachings, in the epistles. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10 for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle. I'm not fit to be called an apostle. I am only one because God made me one, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Oh, no. Now that he's fully aware this grace of God would not be in vain in his life. In many Christians, God's grace has gone in vain. He would save them, convert them, 
But then they would not take on the spirit of humility in their lives, and that grace was in vain. But not in Paul's life. It was not in vain. He lived in humility the rest of his days. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, again, he takes no credit. Yet not I, but by, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul never forgot what he was before he encountered God's grace on the road to Damascus. He always kept before him that everything he was as an apostle and all that he did as an apostle was by the grace of God alone. And by these revelations, Paul learned to despise his flesh and to live by faith in Christ Jesus. Paul understood the only good in his flesh, the only good in any flesh, is the God dwelling in that flesh. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's testimony, I say again, is extreme. Being religious, and yet the chief of sinners. And yet, to a lesser degree, there have been many people in churches who were very religious, but in the eyes of God were hypocrites and sinners. People going to churches who were more like the Pharisees than they were like Jesus. Not drawing on the life of the vine, Jesus. Not abiding in Jesus and his word abiding in them. Not being led and directed by the Holy Spirit of truth. Instead, such people quench the Holy Spirit of truth by drawing on other sources for life. The cares of this life choking out the life of the word that was put in them and spiritual growth is stunted. Instead of being justified before God because they live by faith, instead of producing spiritual fruit pleasing unto God, instead they justify themselves by works and sacrifices made, justifying themselves by title or position in the church, lifting themselves up above others, counting themselves something special that they're not. The heart being lifted up and deceived by pride, they believe themselves to be something in God that God says they are not. Wherefore, take heed when you think you stand, lest ye fall. A lack of humility can be a spiritual stumbling block to a person and that will produce blind spots in your relationship with God. Areas in your life that you do not see as God sees about you. Blemishes, wrinkles, even spots that will go unnoticed and undetected in your spiritual garments. Like Paul and other Pharisees, people in this condition, they can pray, Study the Bible, even fast. But without the spirit of humility, it's all in vain. Because they do it for all the wrong reasons. And they do it in the wrong spirit. The pride of their heart has deceived them into believing that there's something, they are something before God that God says they are not. No wonder Jesus declared you'll know them by their fruits, by their spiritual fruits, fruits of righteousness and true holiness, fruits of love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, 
meekness, humility, self-control, patience. Friend, listening to this message, are you justified and by whom? Are you justified before the Lord or are you justified in your own eyes and the eyes of others? You may be thinking, well, how do I know? Your justification will be found right here. Faith in the Word of God. The Word of God is like a mirror. And children of God are to examine their lives in this mirror. And if their lives match the Word, by faith they're justified before God. But if their lives come up short to the teachings found in the Word, then God declares, by that, you are not justified. You have come up short. I hope you take this message to heart. Don't be deceived. Because pride can deceive your heart. And what an awful thing it would be to one day wake up in eternity and find yourself in a place you did not expect to find yourself. To open up your eyes and lift up your eyes in hell, thinking the whole time you were going to go to heaven. When we leave this world, it's only one shot, so to speak. Just like the rapture, one flight out. And we must be careful and diligent, and daily walk softly before the Lord as his servant seeking to do his will, pleasing him with our lives, producing spiritual fruit, well-pleasing to the Father. For anything less than that will lead us astray, off the narrow way which leads to heaven. Pray with me now. If this message has stirred your heart, if the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about things in your life that God is not in agreement with, the Holy Spirit will do that. He is the Spirit of truth. Don't let any pride, any confidence in your flesh deceive you about yourself. Humble yourself before the Lord and before the Spirit of truth. And let Jesus come into your life. Pray this prayer with me now. Say, O oh God, save my soul. I am so sorry for failing you, but I will serve you, Lord, the rest of my life. And I believe the power in the blood of Jesus washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. By God's grace, you have a new life. And by God's grace today, through the sacrifice that Jesus made at the whipping post, you can have healing. You can have your needs supplied. Whatever it is that troubles you, God can move for it. And Jesus said his believers would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Friend, I'm the Lord's believer. Many believers in our midst. Reverend Steve Millar here on the platform. All of us ready to agree in prayer for you. So put your hand against mine on the screen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I bring the people before you now. Lord, you see the need in their life. That they're looking to you in faith, believing, trusting your word trusting the power and the blood of your son's sacrifice. Lord, in the name of Jesus, lay a healing hand upon them. Break the bondage in their life. Supply the need in their life. In the holy blood name of Jesus, heal them now. Heal them now. Let that healing virtue flow to them. And oh God, do move in a most blessed way through Jesus. Move for them now. And Lord, will give you the honor the praise and the glory in the holy blood name of Jesus and amen.
and watch every sign of improvement and know God is moving and rejoice in the word, the promise of deliverance. Rejoice in what God is doing. Rejoice in faith till God brings you out completely. And let us know what God has done for you. And those of you here today, if any of you are in need of prayer at this time, feel free to get up, go over to the side, and I'll meet you over there to minister unto you. And the rest of you, stay to your feet. Come to the altar today. Present yourself before the Lord. And those of you online, whether you're at church or you're at home, stand to your feet. Lift up your hands unto the Lord. I'm going to pray for you. And those of you who are without the Holy Ghost, if you're a child of God, it's time to receive this gift. God makes it clear in His Word, in the book of Acts, that the Holy Ghost baptism is His gift to His children. And it's time to receive. And the initial evidence of receiving this gift is the Holy Ghost speaking through you in an unknown language. Then you'll know He has arrived. The gift is yours. Lift up your hands unto the Lord, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I bring all the people before you now. O oh God, in your word, you promised this gift to your children. And O oh God, we accept it. We accept it. And now, Lord, I pray for them. Lord, anoint them to receive this gift from the Holy Ghost. This gift of the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus, I call the anointing down upon them. In the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. And just start praising the Lord. Wherever you're at, start praising Him and don't stop. Keep praising. Keep praising and glorifying Jesus till the Holy Ghost comes in. Till the Holy Ghost comes in and takes over and speaks in the name of Jesus. Praise in the King. Praise in Jesus. Glorify in Jesus. Yes. Glorify in Jesus. Praise. In Jesus, love in Jesus, lifting up those praises. It's you in Jesus, just you in Jesus, just yielding on over. Let that power be greater and greater in your body. Glorify in Jesus, glorify in the Lifting up those praises until All and receive. Here's your Lord on Jesus. On the altar of sacrifice. Just you and Jesus. Your heart. Praise in Jesus. Praise in Jesus. Fall in love with those praises. Fall in love with those praises. Just you and Jesus, glorify in Jesus, praise in the King, praise in the King, just you and Jesus, just you and Jesus, glorify in Jesus, glorify in Jesus, praise in Jesus, praise in Jesus, love in Jesus. Holy, glorify in 
Peace, Peace and sweet.